Assalamu alaikum. Today we will be discussing immunogenetics and B cell development. We will start with immunogenetics. So to start our discussion on Im immunogenetics, we need to understand the need for the process of immunogenetics, which is important for the rearrangement of the genes inside of the B cells and the T cells. As you can see from the numbers on the screen, we find that the genes in the human body are far, far less than the antigens in the environment around us. So even if every single gene in the human body was used to form an antibody, we will still not be able to combat every single antigen in the environment. And yet we find that the human body is capable of producing antibodies to every single antigen in the environment around us. Not only that, but the lymphocytes, each single one of the lymphocytes is only selective to a single type of antigen and cannot interact with two or more antigens. It can only interact with a single antigen. To drive that point further, you'll find that each lymphocyte will undergo allelic exclusion, where basically it will take the genome of the maternal or the paternal side and exclude the other one just to make sure that it doesn't form uh, receptors from each of the genome, from the paternal and the maternal. No, it will only form a receptor that is taken either from the paternal genome or from the maternal genome. And this ability for our body to make an, uh, antibodies for every single antigen in the environment is a result of splicing, rearrangement, and combinatorial mixing of exons in the genes. These genes that are responsible for the formation of the antibodies and the T-cell receptors. Now, going further in the lecture, I will only be addressing the antibody side, so the immunoglobulins, but know that everything that I mention about the, T uh, about the antibodies or the immunoglobulins is um, basically the same for T-cell receptors. It's only slightly different structure, but it's, they're both taken actually from the same genes. The only, uh, the only difference is the post-translational modifications, basically. Okay, now let's talk about the immunoglobulin molecule since we will be uh, basically talking about its production. So as you can see here, the immunoglobulin molecule is made of a heavy chain and a light chain. Each one of these chains is made of a, two domains, the constant domain and the variable domain, so the C and the V. The C is encoded by an independent gene segment from the V domain. So each one of these domains is actually encoded by a different segment of the genome. And the V, of course, from the name variable, it is the one that is responsible for the ability of having antibodies that are specific for all antigens. And that's why we will be discussing the V domain further mainly. So the V domain in uh, is different in the heavy chains and in the light chains. In the heavy chains, you'll find that there are three gene segments that actually make uh, this domain. These segments are called the variable V, the diversity D, and the joining J. So the V, D, J are present in the heavy chains, while the light chain only have two segments. So they are the variable and the joining. So the heavy chains have V, D, J, the light chains have V and J. And this here is an example of the portion of the chromosome that has these um, antibody uh, gene, basically, where here you will find the V exons, here you will find the D exons, the J exons, and the C for the constant domain. In the human genome, you'll find that we have around five, uh, 50, 51 Vs, V exons, around 20 D exons, and around uh, 6 J exons. So around 51, 27, and 6. So from the combinations of these numbers alone, we'll find that we have around 8,262 combinations around that number. And these combinations, even though 8,000 combinations is a lot, it's still nothing compared to the extreme amount of uh, antigens in the environment. So how do we actually form enough antibodies? Now let's go through the process of uh, the formation 
of uh, the complete, basically, of the, the arrangement of the um, DNA to form these antibodies. So here we have, as you can see, the DNA segment, the one that I showed you just now. Note that this is still the DNA. So this is in the nucleus. We are changing, the cell will change the blueprints in the nucleus. It will not change just the RNA. It will change actually the DNA itself. So what happens is that in the first step, it will take the Vs as they are. All the V exons are placed as they are. But the D and the J, they will, uh, the cell will choose an exon from the D, an exon from the J, and join them together. And it will, of course, leave the C constant as it is. This is done by pro uh, the proteins RAG1 and RAG2. And this is what we call the D to J recombination. So it is a combination, basically, of the D and J. And this is done by the action of RAG1 and RAG2. And this is the first step of the immunoglobulin gene arrangement. The second step goes one step further and takes an exon from the V and joins it to the DJ. The C stays as it is, and this is also done by the actions of RAG1 and RAG2. This is what we call the V to DJ recombination. Lastly, after all of this is done, while yes, we have the V, the D, and J, there is one more step to do. This step is basically to take the, um, the area between the J and the C1 and add to it random nucleotides. These random nucleotides are added by the action of the protein terminal deoxynucleotide transferase TDT and this process is called junctional diversification. So the, pro the three steps are D to J recombination done by RAG1 and RAG2, V to DJ recombination done by RAG1 and RAG2 as well, and the last one is junctional diversification done by terminal deoxynucleotidyl transferase, TDT, where addition of random nucleotide is done between the J exon and the C1 exon. Now let's talk further about the antibody diversity. How does it really occur? So we saw right now that the RAG1 and RAG2 did the recombination, but it doesn't only do recombination. RAG1 and RAG2 are actually very imprecise, and that is somehow beneficial for us. Because of their imprecision, they can add or remove a few nucleotides during recombination. So they remove a bit of the nucleotides from either the V, the D, the J, they also remove it, or they will add nucleotides. And this will contribute a bit to the diversity. But the biggest contribution to diversity is actually uh, achieved by TDT, because it adds up to 20 nucleotides randomly in the junctional regions between the J and the C. This addition is uh, called the junctional diversity, as we mentioned. And this area between the J and the C is what we call the CDR3 region. And if you remember from the antibody, the area CDR3 is actually the most variable. It's hyper variable. It's the most variable part of the antibody. And now let's look again at the uh, gene that was formed before. So this area right here between the V and the D is what we call the C. It will develop to become the CDR1 once the antibody is completely formed, translated, and formed. The area between D and J is actually CDR2, while this area between the J and the C, this is CDR3, which is, which is again, the most hyper-variable part of the antibody. And this is basically it for immunogenetics. Now let's go on further with B cell development. The development of B cell happens in different places depending on the age of the person. So during the fetal life, you will find that the B cells develop in the livers, while in the afterbirth, you will find it develops mainly in the bone marrow. Immature B cells that, you know, they, that develop from the bone marrow are capable of leaving the bone marrow and migrating towards the spleen. These immature B cells only express IgM, they migrate to the spleen, where they start expressing IgDs 
and they are called follicular B cells. This will be explained further with uh, the upcoming slides. So let's go through the stages of B cell development, starting from the first stage. The first stage is the, actually the earliest stage that is committed to the B cell line, and we call it the pro B cell. So the pro B cell is the earliest cell that is committed to the B cell line. This cell only expresses these following surface markers, CD10 and CD19. These sur uh, surface markers are actually, these cell markers are actually um, specific for B cells, but these B cells do not express any immunoglobulin on the surface. What's happening inside of this B cells, a B cell at the current time would be basically everything we mentioned thus far of the recombination and junctional diversification, but only happening to the mu heavy chain. So the heavy chain that, is, that will develop to become the IgM, the heavy chain for the IgM immunoglobulin is right now going through gene recombination and junctional diversification. So again, the pro B cell has CD10, CD19, but no immunoglobulin. And the process that's happening in it is the re gene recombination and junctional diversification of the mu heavy chain. Next stage happens once this uh, recombination is done, you'll find that the cell will start expressing an incomplete IgM. This incomplete IgM is what we call a pre B cell receptor. And it consists of the completed mu heavy chain since the mu heavy chain has undergone the uh, recombination, but it will be associated to a light chain that we call a surrogate light chain. The surrogate light chain is made of two proteins called lambda B and V pre B proteins. And as you can see here, this is the pre B cell receptor. The heavy chain is complete and it, it will stay as it is until uh, like when the B cell becomes mature, it will stay as it is. But here the light chain is what we call a surrogate light chain with the V pre B and the lambda phi. You will also find these Ig alpha and Ig beta. These are responsible for signal transduction from the receptor to the inside of the cell. And just as I mentioned, signal transduction, actually this receptor even though it's a pre B cell receptor and it's kind of incomplete, it can still be stimulated. And actually its stimulation is responsible for the largest proliferation of B lineage cells in the bone marrow. So in the bone marrow, the greatest amount of proliferation, proliferation and growth of the B cells is um, pr uh, achieved by the stimulation of the pre BCRs. Now, Going further, as we as I said, the pre B cell has a pre B cell receptor. The heavy chain is complete. The light chain is a surrogate light chain. Further, we have um, during the stage of the pre uh, of the pre B cell. Yes, we have a complete um, heavy chain, but in the nucleus of the cell, you'll find that the junctional uh, the junctional diversification and the recombination is occurring to what? It's occurring to the light chain, specifically the kappa light chain. Okay, so the genetic rearrangements are happening to the kappa light chain. Once these genetic rearrangements are complete, you will find that the B cell receptor will become completed with a complete light chain, a complete heavy chain. Together, they form the complete IgM protein. And at this point, we call the cell an immature B cell. So an immature B cell will have a complete IgM and only a complete IgM. The pre B cell, B cell will have a pre BCR with a heavy chain and a surrogate light chain, while the pro B cell will have no IgM and only the surface markers CD10 and CD19. Once immature B cells are formed, the bone marrow will start testing them to see which of them are functional and which of them are dysfunctional. It tests them via this mechanism called central tolerance. So, central tolerance happens by a, a positive and negative selection of immature B cells, where they are presented with self antigens, and if they bind to these self antigens too strongly, the receptor will be edited to induce a new form of the V domain. 
If this new form of glutamine, so the new receptor, is dysfunctional, either by binding too strongly or not strongly enough, apoptosis of this immature B cell will be induced. And this is the entire process of the uh, central tolerance. And this apoptosis is uh, this apoptosis of the dysfunctional immature B cells is called clonal deletion. So central tolerance happens in the bone marrow. And it happens to what type of B cells? To immature B cells. Now, cells that pass this central tolerance are capable of leaving the bone marrow. They leave the, the bone marrow to migrate towards the spleen. Once they reach the spleen, they start expressing IgD molecules on, uh, plus their IgM molecules. So they will have IgD and IgM. They will occupy follicles in the spleen where they are named follicular B cells. These follicular B cells are actually capable of leaving the spleen as well. And uh, they leave the spleen going towards peripheral lymphoid organs like lymph nodes, for example. And they can respond to the antigens in these peripheral lymphoid organs. If they do not encounter any antigen for the upcoming few months, they will undergo apoptosis, however. Okay? So the next step after the immature B cell leave after passing the uh, central tolerance is follicular B cells which have IgD and IgM occupy follicles and, uh, and they can populate peripheral lymphoid organs where they respond to antigens. And this is an example of a follicle in the spleen. This follicle is populated by a ton of B cells while this paraarteriolar lymphatic sheath over here is actually populated by a ton of T cells. And this is the spleen. These B cells are capable of leaving or, or um, interacting with antigens in the spleen itself. Now, we, t we said that if it doesn't encounter any antigens, it will undergo apoptosis. But what happens if it does encounter antigens? If it does encounter antigen, it will rapidly proliferate, forming either antibody-producing plasma cells or memory B cells. And even these plasma cells can go and form memory B cells. <clears throat> so, um, some of these uh, B cells will not only become plasma cells or memory cells or whatever, but they will also undergo something called heavy chain isotope switching. So it will change the heavy chain. And the ch uh, changing heavy chain will basically mean that it goes from an IgM or an IgD, it will stop only forming the IgM or IgGD, and it will start forming IgGs or IgAs or IgEs, depending on if the um, constant uh, gene is the mu, it will make an IgM. If it's the delta, it will make IgDs. If it's the epsilon, it makes IgEs. If it's the alpha, IgAs. If it's the gamma, IgGs. But what is important is that some of these B cells that, inter, uh, that encounter antigens will be able to go through this heavy chain isotope, isotype switching. And this is how the B cells are capable of producing uh, antibodies other than IgM and IgD. And lastly, the B cells with the greatest affinity to the particular antigen that is currently in the body. So there's, the body has, a, has one antigen that is currently uh, being fought against. So the B cells with the greatest affinity to this particular anti antigen will grow and proliferate much more than all other B cell lineages, basically. And this is the process that is known as affinity maturation. So affinity maturation is the growth of the B cells that have the greatest affinity to the particular antigen in the body. And this is the end of the video. Here are the resources used for making this video, and thank you for listening.